Hi, I'm Christopher Godwin and I've been an actor for 61 years and this is a video about my entire theatrical career compiled by Michael Lawrence and where he found half the stuff I've no idea but I hope you enjoy it. Well, Christopher, thank you for your time today. We're going to start with what we call the what happened to Christopher Godwin, even though acknowledging that you're still very much active. So let's start with question number one. What is your full name given at birth? Christopher Page Godwin. When is your birthday and the year of your birth? August the 5th, 1943. A good year, but going over a bit now. And as a child, where were you born and raised? Well, I was born during the war and we went to Loughborough for my birth, which is the home of my maternal grandparent, uh, my maternal parents. So I was there for about three months and then we moved up to the Lake District where my mother had been evacuated with the Royal College of Art and we stayed in a place called Ambleside and understood that I was rattled up and down the Lakeland tracks in a pushchair which may account for the fact that I grew to be six foot three <laughs> but um, um, Dad used to come up and visit uh, he was in the RAF and then we followed him around the RAF camps a bit so we finished the war in a place called um, South End Common, which is near to Henley. And he was at, I think the base was called Medmanham. He made all the three-dimensional maps for things like the Dam Busters Raid and so on. And that's where we finished the war, in Henley. If any, how many brothers or sisters did you have? I've got one brother who's four years younger and he became a market gardener in France. He was, um, he started off in interior design, sculpture rather, and then interior design, and then worked for Chelsea Girl, designing their shops. And then he decided that wasn't for him, so he became, went to uh, an agricult agricultural college over here and became a market gardener in France, near to Toulouse where he still lives and he's now retired. What is your earliest memory of going to the cinema or the theatre? Hmm. I think it's probably being taken to a pantomime uh, when I was, I don't know, six. And we arrived to find that we I believe this is correct, we got a double booking. So, very disappointing, but then Dad did something magical and we were put into a box on stage right of the stage. And at one point, it was Cinderella. And at one point, Button said, is there anybody who can tell me what this is? And Dad said, you know what it is? I said, I know what it is, it's a rabbit. He said, well, tell them. So I stood up in a box and shouted, it's a rabbit. And I remember all the faces were suddenly turning. And all the auditorium went white as people tried to see where the noise had come from. <laughs> Immediately I sunk down behind the lip of the box and didn't re-emerge. <laughs> and growing up, did you have a favourite actor or actress whose work you really admired? That's quite difficult to answer. Um, I think it was writers that got me originally, that Dylan Thomas, who I remember reading um, My 30th Year to Heaven on the Radio 3. And from there, I think probably John Gielgud and Laurence Olivier were 
and Ralph Richardson, the three big people, were the ones that influenced me. I remember seeing Hamlet and Richard III on film, not stage. And that was magical. And the school I went to, which was Alain's school in Dulwich, is where the National Youth Theatre started by a man called Michael Croft, which I did audition for but didn't get in. They said that I could have a job sweeping backstage or something, and I said, well, at the age of 14, I said, well, no, I can't be an actor. I don't want to join. So uh, I did all the school productions but was never part of the National Youth Theatre. Was there an actual event or trigger that first prompted you to seriously consider acting as an actual profession? And how old were you at the time? I think the first, as it were, performance impetus came from a primary school that I was sent to when we moved to Blackheath. Um, which I now know was perhaps not a very good school there. And I didn't fit in, I had the wrong accent, uh, I wasn't nearly streetwise enough. But there was a nativity play, and I played one of the kings, and it's coming out get a laugh by picking my nose before I gave the casket. Not a very subtle way of getting a laugh, but there you go and something clicked, but really it was when I came to leave school and I had, I couldn't get into university to read English because I didn't have maths. I'm not exactly enumerate, but to give you an idea that friends I have still make me score at darts because it gives them a laugh. <laughs> and so I thought, what have I really enjoyed doing at school? And what I'd enjoyed doing was the school plays. I thought, well, I'll be an actor. My father was a sculptor, and he was a head of sculpture at Manchester College of Art and Design, eventually. But at the time I wanted to go to drama school, he was freelance, and he would have earned just too much and just too little to get a grant. And I thought, well, OK, I'll I'll do it myself. So I went around all the theatres in London trying to get a job and was told to do something quite inventive with myself, uh, but no job. Uh, but that's when the search started. They went away, my parents went away on holiday and said, if you're still here when we get back, we'll throw you out. So I was still there when they came back, but I had a plan having been around the theatres in London, and I said, can you lend me nine shillings and sixpence, it was, return fare to Canterbury? And Mum said, all right, what for? I said, I, I've got an interview at a theatre. That was a lie. I went to the Marlowe Theatre, Canterbury, and I asked to see the director, who was in rehearsals. So I saw the theatre manager, who said, no, we, if you want a job, you've got to see both of us. So I went back later and I saw the director, but not the theatre manager. So I went back again. Neither of them were available. By this time, the receptionist kind of knew me. And uh, she said, try 5.30. So fourth and final time, went back at 5.30 and they were both there. And I blagged my way into the theatre looking after the boilers because the guy had just retired. In fact, I really didn't look after the boilers at all. I became a technical ASM, and that's how it all started. So did you ever attend a stage school or audition, study, or formally train to be an actor anywhere? Nope. I'm sure people can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Even before you began your acting career, or maybe when you were between roles at any point in your career. What other non-acting jobs have you done? Oh, God. Loads. I mean, I, I could never do that thing about sitting and waiting for the phone to ring. So 
I was the stage manager of a strip club in Wardour Street at one point. Um, a check had passed. And uh, I worked for various secretarial agencies, and I worked on building sites, and I worked for uh, a place called Air Call, which was an early form of messaging in uh, London. Uh, a driver, mini cabbing. Yeah, quite a lot, really. So, what was your first ever paid acting performance, i.e., your professional debut, and again, how old were you? I was 19, and it was at the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury, and it was a play called um, To Dorothea's Son. And at one point, a postman had to come in and deliver letters. And they didn't have enough money for the uniform trousers, but they had the hat and they had a jacket and I had a sack. So I walked past the window. You could hear me coming because I whistled Addie Laurie. And as I approached the window, I threw a packet of letters through the window and said, post, and that was it. The play was written by Roger McDougall. Ah. Can you remember how old you were or what production you were working on when someone first asked for your autograph? <laughs> Gosh. I think I don't know. I, it, was, it was probably in Cardiff when I actually became an, an actor full-time as opposed to an ASM or DSM to play. Uh, and it was in, Canter in uh, Cardiff and it was the Welsh National Theatre about the third time they tried and I was still on stage management and the I came in one day to work and they said Warren Jenkins the director wants to see you so I went in and he said uh, look old boy he said we've uh, hit a bit of a problem he said the bloke who was going to play hair in Doctor and the Devils can't do it how about you having a go and I thought, that's a third lead. I said, yes, of course I can, but I'll need more money. And he went, oh, how much? I said, well, I, I was on nine pounds a week. I said, I'll need another quid. And he went, oh, that's all right. So um, I got the job and I played hair and Doctor of the Devils. And I think it was that when I was first asked for an autograph and that had been 19, 60. Uh, it's also where I met Alan Aitborn for the first time, of which more and on. I think I was, it was about 1963 or 4, something like, no, it must have been later than that. Probably about 1964, yeah. And did you ever put much thought into the construction of your autograph? Because I see that you typically sign Chris normally rather yeah. than Christopher. Yeah. What would be the reason for that? <laughs> it was easier to put on the head of a, an examination form rather than Christopher, which of course at school you had to put your name and form on the top right hand side, on one side of A4, and um, as soon as I could I started signing myself Chris rather than Christopher. Although in programmes I was advised, go down as Christopher, and I said why? And they said, it takes up more space. So Chris Godwin I signed. Still. At any point in your life of your career, have you ever been starstruck when meeting anybody famous? And have you asked anybody for their autograph? I don't think I have. I mean, I was, I've been starstruck by people I've met. Um, <clears throat> Michael Gambon, uh, Angelica Houston. Yeah, various other people. Burt Lancaster. Uh, but I don't recall, I've never asked for an autograph 
for me, I had been asked by other people, relatives, to get an autograph from somebody I'm working with, and notably Stephanie Cole, who I worked with for some time, who I, I think is a, just a lovely person and a great actress. Uh, so, but I can't think, I, I don't really think I've ever asked for myself. And here's a loaded question for you, Christopher. To perform, what would you choose? Theatre, television, cinema, or maybe even radio? And what reasons would you give for your answer? I think theatre. I think because try and create it fresh every night and there's an immediate appreciation from an audience as to whether what you've done has credence, whether what you've done has moved them, whether what you've done has made some sort of a difference. So I think theatre. In film and telly you aren't, unless you're a big star, you're not so much in control of what actually goes on the screen. Uh, your performance can be altered quite radically in an edit suite. I think radio is also very interesting. That business about creating a sound picture, I've always found fascinating. I mean, it was an early fan of The Goon Show, which had some wonderful pictures in it. Uh, but I think theatre, really, yeah. Has my heart. Yeah. Which of your past performances or characters would you say people remember you for the most? Hmm. Do you mean the majority of people? Yes. Probably the film of Porridge, actually, with Ronnie Barker. Partly because that was has been extremely high profile. It's been shown every Christmas and Easter and for God knows how long, and there have been no repeats. Um, but, um, yeah, I should think Porridge, although there'll be certain people who remember me from stage and from uh, series on the television and things, but Porridge mostly, yeah. Every time it's shown, somebody will accost me and say, can't you ride a bike yet? <laughs> Whether it be for what you did on stage or screen, which of your own individual performance or performances are you the most proudest of? That's quite hard actually because you What's freshest in your mind, of course, is what you last played, which was uh, at the National in Grapes of Wrath. But looking back, I wrote a one-man show uh, called The Governor, which was about Sir Henry Irving, who is a bridge figure between the old Victorian barnstorming actor and our modern uh, way of acting. Um, a lot of people in his company went on to be playwrights from whom our tradition continued. So I think playing Sir Henry and Walter Collinson, who is the same, who was his dresser, I hasten to add this was written quite a long time before uh, The Dresser was written. And I think playing those two characters, Sir Henry, the governor, and Walter, were very satisfying. There have been others that uh, I have invested in who've made, meant a lot to me, like Henry IV, who uh, I felt a great affinity with in his dilemma and the character. It's, it's tricky. It is a tricky question because, of course, Later, in what the French call Esprit d'Escalier, I shall remember all sorts of things which I was invested in and can't recall at the moment. <laughs> Norman, in the Norman Conquests in Scarborough, which was because I worked there for so long with April, and uh, the trilogy of the Norman Conquests, I was the original Norman in that. And 
I became very close to him. Yeah. Great. Is there a part or a role that you still remember today that you auditioned for, really wanted, but didn't get? How long have you got? I, I can't go back over them. I mean, nowadays you do an audition for a part that you'd really like, you don't get it, you think, oh, fuck it, and just carry on. <laughs> and if it happens, great, and if it doesn't, you just forget about it. Was there ever an acting part that you had to turn down, maybe due to filming commitments elsewhere, that you again later regretted? Yes, uh, there was actually. Aikborn had a sabbatical year directing at the National Theatre and he wanted me to join the company, but I couldn't because I was... I can't remember exactly what I was doing now, but I couldn't do it because I was contracted to somebody else and couldn't get out of it. Right. What is your most favourite film of all time? that everyone should go watch. <laughs> oh, golly. Uh, that really is a hard one. Um, <clears throat> uh, Throne of Blood, which is the Japanese version of Macbeth. Um, do you know, I really don't have an answer to that one, apart from that. The, Things that changed my outlook on life. Threads, which when it was first broadcast, the um, aftermath of a nuclear explosion in Sheffield, I think it was. Um, no, I really, that is, that's very tough. What's, I think what's formed me more has been writing or poetry. I agree, you know, there are seminal films which will no doubt come back to me, but I certainly that things I've read have probably influenced me more. Would you care to name any? Poets or writers? Um, <clears throat> writing. A number of people, I mean Steinbeck, yes. Um, Coldwell, um, but poets, uh, certainly E. E. Nesbitt, e. e. Nesbit, um, Wordsworth, Hardy, uh, Sharon Olds, Tom Gunn, James Fenton, um, uh, Saint Carl Sandberg, uh, Walt Whitman to a degree. Uh, Edward Thomas, Robert Frost, all these people really had a bearing on film. But there have been others as well who, whose poem I may have read and it's made a great impact but I can't recall their name now. Great, fantastic list of names there. <laughs> Going back to your career Chris, can you name a co-star that you liked working with the most? and maybe a little bit more controversial, those that you had a tougher time working with, <laughs> namely people you didn't like. <laughs> people I've liked working with. Uh, well, Patricia Hodge was great. Chris Benjamin also is lovely to work with. Greg Hicks. Um, <clears throat> Cherry Jones, who I've just finished working with. Uh, Ronnie Barker, I thoroughly enjoyed working with, both on stage and on film. Uh, he was such a nice bloke and such a good actor. Um, others. Paul Eddington. Ones I haven't enjoyed working with. I think we should draw a veil. Oh, <laughs> Very diplomatic. Rather than asking you who your favourite director was or is, 
I'll ask it in a slightly different way. What does a director need to do to get the best performance out of Chris Godwin? Well, I think that what a director has to do, whether for Chris Godwin or anybody else, is to create an atmosphere in rehearsal where you can feel completely free and unthreatened. And there should be laughter, because laughter opens you up and allows you to be more open with how you react to your colleagues. So if the director creates a good rehearsal atmosphere in that way and is prepared to take on board what you bring, as well as what the play brings and what they're bringing to it, then that's, that's a kind of perfect situation. Uh, I remember saying to a very established director recently, he said, what's the most important thing for you in a rehearsal? And the subject that he was going to direct was fairly serious, and I said, the most important thing is laughter. And his eyebrows shot up and he said, laughter? I said, yeah. I didn't get the job. I think directors that I've really enjoyed working with is one recently, um, Carrie Cracknell, uh, that um, Alan Eggborn I would always go and work for because I found him an extraordinary director with a, a sixth sense of where an actor should try and place himself within uh, a play. Um, Dominic Drum Gould I thoroughly enjoyed working with. And, uh, a, a rather rougher, more muscular approach than Eggborn, but I really enjoyed it. Um, Alan Strachan. Um, yeah, all these people were able to create atmospheres in rehearsal where you could feel free to invent and to follow your your inclination. But also, uh, you know, you could you have to remain open to them and say, uh, well, I don't I don't see how that could work. But it's it's important that they should listen and you should listen. And is there a particular directing style or maybe a personality that doesn't resonate well with you at all? Uh, yes, I think so. That a director who is only interested in pictures and not the play, uh, I think that is somebody I'm not that interested in working with. Uh, the some directors want to create a spectacle, a, a pageant, a, and I think if they ignore the play at that point, then they ignore the actor and they want to impose their own um, spectacular vision on a piece. On a piece, and I think that doesn't interest me. I'm interested in the text. And I'm interested in where the character goes and I'm interested in trying to tell the story of the play in the best way possible. Great. A bit of a left field one for you now, Chris. You are hosting an intimate dinner party and you're able to invite three guests to come along, other than your dear wife and maybe your sons, alive or dead, in the profession, outside of the profession, who would you choose to invite and why? Hmm. Theatre-wise, I think I'd like to invite Alan Eggborn and I'd like to invite Shakespeare. And I'd like to invite Samuel Pepys. <laughs> okay, I'd like to invite Alan because I have a long history with him and uh, having known him for so long and we make each other laugh. And I respect his views on theatre and I respect his views on how theatre should be carried out. Shakespeare, because he is still such an enigma and yet so well known and so encyclopedic in the way he encompasses so much of human feelings and situations. 
and Samuel Pepys because I, I'm just fascinated in that 17th century view of the world and how much was happening. And I was so upset when his diaries stopped, when his speech got, when his sight got too bad, that I really felt bereft. It should make an interesting mix. Sir Henry, partly because I got to know him so well through research, which my wife initiated. She found the reading list for me because I was busy in the theatre rehearsing during the day and playing at night. And she got a reading list together and the Scarborough librarian in fact found the books for me. There were about, I don't know, I had about eight or nine. And I remember coming down to London to go to the um, Garrick because they have a, an, a big library about theatre. And asking the custodian there, do you have anything on Sir Henry Irving? <laughs> and he said, well, all of the shelf behind you, most of the shelf over there, and this shelf here. And I thought, ah, oh, I'll stick to my eight books, thanks very much. And, but Henry, because he was such an extraordinary iconic figure. I know he was the first theatrical knight, but it was the way he went about researching how the story would be told and how accurate he could be about the period and the time. And it was the early threads of what we use now. And so many people worked with him uh, that then went on to produce theatre and were influenced by him in 19th century theatre in England. Uh, Alan, well, we've been through a lot now. If you could relive one moment from your career once again, maybe it'd be a, a time in your life or a particular production, what would you choose? There are two or three, really. The first was actually opening in the West End at the Arts Theatre in Alan Akebourne's first play in town, which was called Mr. Whatnot, which bombed. It disappeared in four weeks. But the idea of opening in the West End was extraordinary. That didn't then happen again until 2000 and, uh, no, 1979. But that again was an extraordinary experience as so many threads seemed to come together at that time. But there have been others. Possibly the first night of the play I talked about in Cardiff, The Doctor and the Devil, it's opening as hair at the Cardiff New Theatre, uh, which was the first proper uh, involving acting part I, I'd had. So that was another one. But working with my son in The Woman in Black uh, was extraordinary. And still one of those sort of highlights that I think, gosh, look at that, we did that. <laughs> I have to say, actually, I mentioned the governor in the previous part of this interview, and uh, a one-man show, and I used to rely on the staff at wherever I took it to actually work 124 cues, sound cues and lighting cues, and both of my sons did work that show at some point on their own. <laughs> Looking back over your career, do you have any regrets? If you had your time again, would you have done anything differently or made different choices at any stage? I would have liked to have read English 
at university. I would have liked to have gone to drama school, although I, hmm. no, I would have liked to have gone to drama school, yeah, I think. On the other hand, growing or coming up through theatre the way I did gives you a very pragmatic approach to theatre. And I've worked in drama school since teaching. And some of the aspects of drama school, I'm glad I didn't have to go through differently. Something different. I think, you know, one of the things is that you, you kind of play this profession as it comes at you. It's all very well having a plan, but making the plan work <coughs> with the opportunities you get is very different. And you have to be very fast on your feet because where you what is it Lennon said, life is what happens to you when you're planning to do something else. Well that's theatre. I remember working with Michael Horden and saying, I'd love a career like yours. He said, Oh no, he said, I've just taken what came next. And I thought, yeah, that's that's probably what I've done. Tell us something about you that most people don't that most people would not already know? Maybe any hobbies, pastimes, passions that you have a keen interest in? I carve wood. I don't think many people know that. Possibly in the last cast that I played with in Grapes of Wrath, there are some people there know, but no, I carve wood. My dad was a sculptor and uh, I, when he died, the idea of creating form had always been interesting and I still think in terms of shape when I've got a new character to play, I mean what's their body shape, how do they look, um, but when dad was alive sculpture was his bag and I didn't do anything like that. I had been a theatre carpenter at one point but that didn't quite count. But when he died, about a year after his death, I asked Mum if he any wood carving tools still. She said, I've just given them away to a young, to the art school where he finished his career in Manchester College of Art and Design, and there to be a prize for a young sculptor this next year. I said, well, is there anything left? And there were two gouges, a quarter inch gouge and a slightly heavier duty one, a bit shallower. And I started carving uh, on a, a huge piece of sycamore, about two foot six high and about 18 inches thick, and made a monumental head. And that's when it started, and that was about 1992. So, yeah, carving wood, which I still do. I've got something on at the moment. Fantastic. So, final question. Acknowledging that you're still very much active, but finish the sentence. What happened to the actor Christopher Godwin? He's still here. He's still going. And he's still open for business. And what do you have planned for the rest of the year going into 25? Anything you could talk about? I'm shortly doing a, a film uh, playing a blind man, which will be challenging and interesting. I've no idea what 2025 holds. At 81, you're never too sure. Uh, I just hope some other stuff comes up. Be good. See you there. <laughs> Thank you very much.